one side is the fact that, you know, we just went through a pandemic, which we're pretty much almost out of it. Thank God. Um, where kind of, all right, everyone stood still and now you get to do things that you didn't do before. Musicians got to create more than before. You know, writers got to write more, videographers got to film more, et cetera, et cetera. So and now you have streaming. So pretty much anyone can really post their music on a streaming platform. So you can literally have your art next to Picasso, right? I can have my song next to, you know, Justin Bieber, <laughs> just to kind of give you. So I think that's really cool at the same time. I do feel like there is the mainstream kind of corporate formulas that that's never going to end. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ship of Hope channel, Host Speaks. This is the podcast where we talk a lot about entertainment. We talk with artists, musicians, actors, editors, all above. Uh, real quick promo for everybody that doesn't know, we released the Shield of Hope celebration, our sixth year. That is now up on YouTube. That, that will be by the time you watch this, if you're watching live, it'll be the last uploaded video. So thank you guys. we got some big announcements in there. But now we're going to cut it back to our, our guest that we have today, which I'm very excited about. One of the coolest dudes that I've met. He also has a band. He has, I don't know if he sings or not, but he plays a lot of instruments. And I'm going to kick it over to John Sandoval. John, how are you doing today? Donnie, you're the man, bro. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining me. Um, for thank I, you for having me, man. So my introductions is based off how what I know of you, and for everybody, everybody that jumps on, I I want you to introduce yourself because only you know yourself. So for the audience that doesn't know you, who are you, John? Oh man, how how much time do we have again? <laughs> Actually, I don't I don't like to talk about myself, but um, John Sandoval. Uh, let's see, uh, you know, uh, I have two beautiful kids, a uh, little boy, three year old boy, six year old girl, uh, beautiful wife, been married for almost ten years. And uh, man, you know, I love uh, love to worship. Uh, you know, I'm a I used to be a worship pastor for about uh, 15 years, and now I'm kind of in a different place in life, doing some production. I also uh, play play music. I produce music. I play guitar and several other instruments that uh, you know you probably won't hear me in public. Um, I love to make albums. I love to uh, arrange. I love to write music. So really, in a nutshell, man, uh, you know. Uh, Pretty much, you know, Jesus, family, and a lot of music and cool creative stuff, I guess, in a nutshell. <laughs> so take us down this road in life, because was was creating songs and being musicians something you always wanted to do growing up? Did it run in the family? I know we had a few musicians on in the past. Chuck Peterson, who's actually in your band, talked yes. a lot about uh, his dad. favorite and his, people in the world. Talked a lot about his dad and his inspiration for him. Um, do you have any family members? Did they get you in the music or did you just kind of dive down that road and discover it yourself? Yeah. So growing up, uh, my dad was a pastor for about 30 years. So, uh, we would have house church and we would go to, you know, once a month have like big gatherings, you know, uh, those gatherings, you know, now looking back at, you know, it's cool that you're, you know, asking me that question, looking back, it's like, man, there's probably, there were probably like 40 or 50 guitar players in the front, just chugging along and playing chords and i remember being like what four or five years old just kind of you know being into it and clapping and of course i was a kid so i would go outside and play with the kids but all that stuff definitely i believe influenced me um you know so my dad played a little bit my uncle played a little bit my brother-in-law actually kind of taught me a few chords here and there um but i'll tell you man i've always been a huge michael jackson fan when I was about probably like six or seven, like I, I had every move down. At least I thought I had every move down. Looking back, I'm like I'm I was terrible, uh, <laughs> but I loved Michael Jackson. I knew I knew I loved music absolutely, and that genre that he did because he was so um, uh, cross generational, cross cultural. He kind of you know he he, he bridged so many gaps, um, you know. So I thought I was going to be a dancer like Michael Jackson for a little while. And then, uh, you know, kind of kind of dropped it a little bit, you know, diving into the teenage years, as you can remember, uh, finding yourself and then it kind of uh, found the guitar. Uh, and then from there, it was like, you know what, this is this is where I, I feel like I can really be myself at the most. So I kind of I knew early on that I wanted to uh, 
make and play music for a living. I didn't know what it looked like quite yet being, you know, 12 and 13, but I knew music was a place where I, I really enjoyed being at and I could really express myself. Now, switching off into the arts, which is this will captivate on that question, but when you talk about you wanted to always create music and you knew that, was there ever a genre that you really wanted to partake in or was it just kind of like, you know, like maybe I'll do the Christian end over here or maybe I'll do more hip hop? Like, was there always a set genre or did you kind of like be all over the place? Well, you know, uh, in my early teens, I mean, I didn't really understand what Christian music was or or that, you know, what secular and Christian. We can probably talk more about that as we go. But um, at that time, man, I just uh, I was really big into rock. Uh, but I always had a really soft spot for uh, like top 40. Like I remember early 90s MTV, man. It was like, you know, uh, TRL was back, you know, around back there. So you had like Boys to Men. And then after that, you had Metallica. And after that, you had Tom Petty. And then after that, you had uh, Aerosmith, you know. So, um, you know, of course, like I was trying to be cool with my friends. So they were more into rock. So, you know, back then I wouldn't necessarily admit that I really enjoyed um, the Batman Forever soundtrack. You know? <laughs> now looking back, I'm like, what an influence in my life that soundtrack was, you know. But uh, I definitely had uh, my ear definitely kind of always gravitated uh, towards, you know, really anything that was really good musically, you know. Uh, but it definitely starting off uh, in the rock world and then somehow I really dove into the blues like really hard like you know following guys like Muddy Waters and B.B. King and Robert Johnson and diving into that whole blues world you know and Eric Clapton um it almost almost became like a blues Nazi like nothing else is cool only blues and anything else is just garbage you know um and then obviously just kind of maturing from that and and beginning to really love and appreciate all genres and then eventually going to college for music which opened up a whole new world for me with jazz you know um so i don't know if that kind of answered your question i tend to go into bunny trails man so feel free to stop me no well i mean that's good because i mean obviously i don't know if it's good that we i i re-emphasize myself a little bit too much when i talk i like to go around in a circle a little bit too but that's good that you talked a lot about that stuff especially so this is a thing that i struggle with for especially filmmaking and I know that we're talking about genres and we'll get a little bit back to that about moving on in that pattern. But when I talk about college, because you said that you learned a lot of this stuff and how to respect things in college, I learned a lot to respect the film industry in college and what professionals do. Yes. But is something, and I know this might be off topic, but is, is music and going to learn music in college, when you have a realm of unlimited possibilities with YouTube platforms, with these master classes coming out, is it worth, in your opinion, to continue to go to college for some of these things? Or is it more, I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit with that question. Um, you know, so in like the late 90s, really YouTube wasn't a thing. I mean, so um, social media wasn't even a thing either. It was, you know, back in the day, it was like Prodigy, America Online, Netscape. I don't know if you remember any of that. Uh, I might be dating myself. I don't know, but... Um, so social media wasn't a thing. YouTube was not a thing. So back then, if I was going to learn anything, it was like I had to wait. I had my VHS tape ready to record and ready to push whenever something would come up. Um, I mean, you know, going to school, man, it definitely opened up a whole new level. It taught me that uh, there's a lot more to music, a lot more, uh, you know, behind the scene things, more, more information that I didn't know at the time. So it was really encouraging because I learned so much, but it was also very humbling because, you know, uh, out of whatever 30 guitar players in my department, you know, uh, I was probably like one of the last ones because everybody was so stinking good, you know, and being in that world, man, everyone practiced like eight to 10 hours a day. So uh, it was definitely, uh, you know, um, it was very demanding. It was very challenging which it really kicked my butt. Um, you know, of course, you look back, there's some, some regrets. So I wish I would have maybe partied just a little bit less <laughs> and do and focused a little more. But uh, but I learned so much, man. And it, it, if anything, it really 
inspired me to to take music to another level and really kind of focus and, and create. You know, so I was a music education major with uh, also a jazz major. Um, now, I'm not necessarily a jazz musician, but I know I try to grab as much as possible from the world of jazz, which is, it's it's unbelievable, man. It's a whole new world. I mean, that's a whole new podcast of stuff. But um, so I know I, I, I loved everything about it, but I also knew that I, I didn't really want to follow that world because I love jazz, but I also love blues. I also loved rock. I also loved funk. I also loved pop. So my I always gravitated to just really good music. So instead of being channeled and focused on one genre, I, I actually I wanted to kind of be all the way around. If I wanted to be in a hip-hop band, I wanted to have the freedom of joining a hip-hop band. Or if I wanted to join a ska band or a, you know, whatever, a, a metal band, I wanted to have the option to do that. No, I mean, that, that's that's great and that's awesome. I I always advise against people going to one set genre. And that's specifically for me in the film industry because I know we're in two different industries, even though they interlap yeah. sometimes. But I always see, and that's this one thing for people that haven't watched the Shield of Hope celebration out there, they know that we're starting up a new production company that's going to be strictly... Uh, where we can have a little bit more edge in our films. And that's really what I wanted to, because like I told you to start the podcast, can't really put a horror film on Shield of Hope. It just doesn't sound right. Um, and of course, and of course, John's over here like, for those of you that don't know, John's over here like, well, they all got saved in the end after they died, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, why not? Um, that's, have that's a twist, man. Have a twist. Everyone gets to know Jesus and everyone goes to heaven. That's All, what the, all the zombies too. That's what the murder should say. You know, I'm going. I'm. I, you're going to go meet your maker. That's what his, his goal is. He's like. He's like a uh, anti-hero of like Thanos, just a little bit worse. <laughs> oh my! Oh gosh! I love it, dude. I love it. Do it, man. Do it. Um, but with that being said, there's so many opportunities out there nowadays. Now you you talked about that there wasn't, and I I can't even pronounce those like prodigy and stuff like that. I have no idea what they are. That that is way before my time. It feels like, even though they might not be. Um, but there's so many opportunities out there nowadays for whether it's musicians, filmmakers. I was talking to a photographer the other day. I did a wedding and I was a video end of the wedding and there was a, they hired another photographer to come in to do pictures only. And we were talking and we were collaborating and they said to us, or they said to me that, you know, the worst thing that happened during the pandemic for them, especially is everybody became photographers overnight because everybody just bought cameras while they stayed at home. So now everybody's a photographer, but I kind of take pride in that. Like I'm over here, like. I like seeing people dive into the industry. I like seeing people, especially in my local area where I don't have a lot of film or photographers. I like seeing people come in that want to act, that want to, and they could, they could start as early as high school. They could be like middle-aged as long as they're getting into the whole idea of like, oh, okay, let's create some, some, not only content, but good content. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on what I'm saying, but for example, like I would like your opinion on if today's opportunities are really good for everybody or they kind of hurt the industry are you like do you think it's good or do you think it's bad uh i'm definitely in between man i think i like you i love the fact that everyone became a photographer i think including myself i might have you know downloaded a cool little photo app and took a few photos put a few filters on them you know some cinematic you know or or like i you know i use final cut and I have all these uh, Lutzes that I use. And I feel like, oh, my goodness, this looks awesome. You know, nowhere compared to you, man. <laughs> you know, so. But at, at the same time, I, I think that um, I, I, I love the the fact that everyone's tapping into their their creative side. Uh, and at least in that in, in the art world. Um, you know, here's how I, I, I see it, man. I think that, uh, you know, it comes to a point that you have to kind of embrace who you are. Because, you know, you go on YouTube, you type in, just type in guitar or type in, uh, you know, any whatever, guitar solo or guitar tutorials. There's going to be, Donnie, there's going to be millions of videos of great guitar players. So it comes to the point that you could either be really discouraged by and be like, I quit because there's no room for me. Or you can be like, you know what? I was created with this gift for a reason. And, you know, you and I, you know, believe in the creator. We believe in God. We believe that God gave us these beautiful gifts, right? So it's like there's a purpose for that. And that's where we have to kind of tap into what that purpose is. And me as a, as a guitar player slash producer and songwriter, you know, I, I kind of learned how to stay in my lane. 
I learned how to uh, recognize what I was good at and also recognize what I was not good at. And it's funny, man. The more you you recognize what you're not good at, uh, it kind of like uh, strengthens the area that you're you're really good at, and it allows you to collaborate. If anything, bro, collaboration in our field is like imperative. It's like so important because I mean, we would not be having this conversation right now if I if you did not respect my gift or if I didn't respect your gift. And then there's a level of respect. So from there on, it's like, man, yeah, of course, there's other videographers that I know, of course, the same way that you know other musicians. But the fact that there's a level of love and respect and kind of digging what you're doing, I think that that's what makes it beautiful. And for me, I learned to kind of like, you know, instead of me trying to be like this guy or be like like that guy, which I grab from all these influences, I realized that if I grab from John Mayer, and then I grab from BB King, and then I grab from Metallica. It's never gonna sound like John Mayer, BB King, or Metallica because it's gonna be funneled through me and come out like me. So I think I've kind of I'm embracing that more. Um, and once you add the whole spiritual side of this, then you're like, well, that's God created me to be different. God created me to be this person. So I'm gonna be the best me that I can be. Boy, that sounds really familiar, but uh. <laughs> You know, I've been editing a song on repeat, as you know what the song is. Um, but that, <laughs> that'll that come out here. And I, listen, I'm excited for that. We won't really talk too much about that. Maybe say that for the end a little bit, just to put some icing on the cake of what could come, especially with your band, too. Like, I want to I wanna get in and talk about your band because what, you're, you're performing in Connecticut coming up, right? Yes, yes. So I live in Colorado now. I moved here about a year ago from Connecticut. So I'll be doing a few, um, a few shows in my home state. That'll, that'll be next week. Also, getting back on the social media conversation with YouTube. I mean, you got a killer YouTube right now. I don't know. You're you're putting out some good guitar little lessons there. I like it, man. Okay, so going back, going back to your question, your question from like a few minutes ago. So, I was like, all right, let me let me dive into these guitar tutorial videos, and you know, and um, it's really cool. I mean, I, I think that if I can be completely honest, I think I might have gotten a little bit discouraged. By the fact that uh, you know you have this pool of 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 you know uh, content from great great guitar players with great video with great stuff, uh, but it's it's re- very difficult to kind of get get out there on YouTube because it's such a saturated pool of of content. You know, I'm still putting putting it out, uh, not as much as I should have, and and as I shared all that with you just a few minutes ago, I'm preaching that to myself. <laughs> well, no, I personally, I think I now as somebody that doesn't know how to play guitar, as somebody that like went for piano lessons at a young age, but like that was it as far as it came. Now I played violin for a little bit, but the violin teacher made me quit. That's a whole different conversation. Anyways, um, nice. but when it came down, when it comes to your work and putting it up on YouTube, and let let's not even go with your work. Let me just say because I was talking to another podcaster the other day. And he's he's been in the podcasting game for about two years now. And I know that he hasn't been happy with his performance. Like it's like, okay, he's putting out all these podcasts weekly, but he's not getting the traction in the audience and he's been doing it for two years. He asked me, he's like, Should you give up? My advice to anybody in that position, and I know I haven't grown as a podcaster that much. We're getting a little bit of growth and some traction, but you have to first love what you do. Because as long as the content you're putting out, now granted it you can have good content, you can have bad content to go back with your points. But if you're not happy with yourself at the end of the day and the content that you're making and that you're enjoying it and you're like, it's a whole podcast here. What we can take away, whether whether there's two people watching this podcast between me and you, John, whether there's 2,000 people watching this podcast or 2 million, the fact is, is we can sit here, talk to each other and take away things from your life, from my life and just incorporate that into our lives. And that's really all that it matters for me personally, sitting here with you guys, having these life conversations. And that's what you need to take away from it. And that's what I take away from it. Yeah, you know, it's funny you bring that up because, the you know, one of the reasons that uh, I kind of like just didn't fully uh, dove into that the whole guitar tutorial world is because, you know, if you follow all the guidelines, okay, you got to, you know, type in, you know, what's trending right now for guitar tutorials. So, and there was all these videos that it's like, well, what, you know, I need to do that so I can get to more subscribers and blah, blah, blah. 
And I'm like, well, there's already 50,000 videos of someone playing a G chord, you know, but I had to kind of follow. And I was like, you know what? That's not really me. That's not really what I want to do. I don't mind teaching G chords. I love teaching the G chord, <laughs> you know, but in that sense, I felt like I could have offered something else. And that's why all the content I put on there, like going back exactly what you said, I'm very passionate about that content about, you know, doing something that's not really quite offered right now. It's a little different enough that that you can get something out of it and not just kind of be like an imitation or a duplication of like whatever's trending right now on YouTube. Do you feel like in society nowadays, do you feel like we're not putting out original work, whether it's in film, whether it's in music? Do you feel like we're replicating more and there's less original work? Or do you think we're I, I look at right now kind of like the Renaissance period? Renaissance period was big in the liberal arts and music and sciences. I feel like when social media took off, when we could reach out and through the internet, it took off and we could do original work. We've kind of gone back to this corporate work. You know, do you think that we're only a few little strands away from going back to this creative content, the indie work, the more inspirational, personal feeling that you get when you put out a song and not so much in the field of what studios want us to do or what records want us to do? Do you feel like we're getting there? I, you know what I, I do. And I think that, um, you know, there's obviously, you know, uh, both two sides to that. And one side is the fact that, you know, we just went through a pandemic, which we're pretty much almost out of it. Thank God. Um, where kind of, all right, everyone stood still. And now you get to do things that you didn't do before. Musicians got to create more than before. You know, writers got to write more. Videographers got to film more, et cetera, et cetera. So and now you have streaming, so pretty much anyone can really post their music on a streaming platform. So you can literally have your art next to Picasso, right? I can have my song next to, you know, Justin Bieber, <laughs> just to kind of give you. So I think that's really cool. At the same time, I do feel like there is the mainstream kind of corporate formulas that that's never going to end, you know, so. I've learned to like just acknowledge it. Uh, you know, like there's bands that, you know, like I remember the band Maroon 5 came out back in like early 2000s. I freaking loved more. I still do. But it's like nothing sounded like Maroon 5. And then like once they kind of exploded, you had these like 20, 30 bands that were pretty much like following the same formula as Maroon 5 because they sold albums, right? They, you know, so I mean, and I acknowledge that, but. I think that we should really focus our energy and our time and our efforts into into doing some some creation, to creating something new. You know, now you have the whole DIY world, right? That you can literally start a business from your home with your phone on Etsy or on eBay or things like that. So, uh, and on your world, I mean, you know, a question to you, bro, would be, how do you feel about Netflix? Because, uh, you know, watching Netflix, I'm like, there's a lot of like B movies, right? Um, and I, I enjoy them because I don't know what the ending is going to be like. You know, most of them have pretty bad endings. <laughs> I, I do like the fact that we're able to, uh, you know, really kind of share and, uh, you know, explore the whole creative world from before. And being able to put it in the mainstream like Netflix is doing and Hulu's doing and other streaming platforms. I mean, I think what Netflix, and I'll try to answer that question the best I can. I don't know if it was rhetorical, but I'll try to answer it for my film audience. Yeah. Um, I love what Netflix is doing. Now, they've made some bad decisions over the last few years, but that it's fine. Um, when it comes to, they've kind of, what how what's the best way to describe this? You know, Disney, for as long as it's been around, of course, Disney Plus is the new drawing crowd. Like, you know, it, that, as soon as that came out, you knew it was going to crack like a billion subscribers because oh, that's what that's what happens. It's a um, big hit at my house. bro. But where would Netflix be if they didn't evolve to making their own films? They'd be extinct. And I and I and I said that a while ago, because, like, if you're not producing your own content because they knew Disney was coming, they knew Amazon Prime was coming. If they did not create their own content, there was nothing else that was going to draw them to the platform because they were all taking. Now, they were paying, obviously, and getting loaned out slash leased these films to keep on their platforms. But eventually, those films were going to go somebody, somewhere else to their home yeah. base. So what Netflix did is great. Um, I don't really know their backs. I know they hire a lot of independent f 
filmmakers and stuff to do these films. Like you look at um, and actually funny story because I don't know if you watch The Outer Banks on Netflix. You know what? It's on. It's yeah. My wife and I have been. I think we started it and then life happened. But it's definitely on on our list of uh, things to watch. Okay, so there was the same buddy that I talked about the podcast earlier about. He didn't know how he felt going forward with um because he's been putting out for two years and he doesn't feel the growth and like as long as you keep going you know and doing what you love just keep going well he he reached out to me one day he's like so i got contacted by he's um somebody on this it was a weird production company name and i was like well do do they have any background like for what they do and they're like no it's kind of shady i was like okay he's like should i should i put in money to try to like to try to sponsor myself slash get headshots slash like promote myself here because they reached out for extras i was like yeah but who do you trust if it's like an off-brand production company or whatever at least needless to say he never went forward with it but you know what show it was which one the outer banks <laughs> there you go and I a, love it. And a, no, See, well, now, now no, 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 I got to no. go watch it. No, 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 no. I turned him away from it because I told him it was a shady <laughs> company. <laughs> you know, dude, and that's the thing. I, you never know, bro. And that's, you know, kind of circling back. It's like, I think that as creatives, man, as, you know, artists, I think we need, just need to release the content, man. And sometimes, you know, I know I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, but I've learned how to get to that ceiling or to that threshold that I'm like, this is definitely not ready. This is definitely not where I want it to be, but I need to let go. Because if I don't let go, it's just going to sit there on a hard drive for who knows how many years. And I've had this talk with a a really talented friend of mine who's had songs and music just kind of sitting there. And I'm like, well, it's been 10 years. You, you, you don't have anything out there. What's People need to hear you, man. People really, he's like, well, it's not ready. I'm like, so it's like, obviously that's his own conviction. That's cool. But I try to encourage him. I'm like, dude, just get it out. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I think going back to the whole Netflix and Hollywood, it's like, we feel that uh, I'm glad the standard, the quality standard has been raised. The bar has, I'm glad. And it should keep getting raised and, 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 and going up every time. But, you know, uh, the flip side of that is that because it has to look and sound this certain way that it's only really kind of like, uh, you know, unless you spend like multi-million dollars, you can accomplish it. I'm like, well, you don't have to do that. I mean, you know, do it right. Do it with excellence. You know, if you have a home studio, like there's a lot of great music being released in home studios right now. Listen, Prince, right? You might have heard of that little artist named Prince, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah emerging artist, right? You might have heard of him. Uh, but listen, man, I mean, he just, he banged stuff out. He just released it. I mean, you know, the dude has vaults and archives and hard drives of, of incredible music that, thank God, it's now beginning to come out. And But he was completely against the, the industry because of this model of like, it has to sound, has to be like this, and which really it doesn't. It's it's art. It's it's meant to be. Of course, you're gonna have your critics in anything you do. You know, you can draw a stick figure and someone say, "Well, that's not quite the right line," or someone can kind of. <laughs> so I think you gotta be really authentic and be true to yourself and release music because again, you add the whole spiritual component to this. You know, I believe that if God has given me a song, if God's giving me ideas. I need to get it out, even if it's for that one person, bro, two people, three people, you know? So forget about the, you know, millions of downloads and streamings and play. That's cool. But at the end of the day, like if it's going to reach like two or three people, like you were saying earlier, you know, if one person's going to like be inspired by this, sign me up, man. I mean, I got to play devil's advocate here because I know that you're happy that they're releasing the content now, especially with Prince. And they did the same thing with Michael Jackson after he passed, correct? They put out some of his older songs slash new to us. Now, because I'm looking at it from this from the fact of when you see somebody like a Carrie Fisher in Star Wars, she passed away, but they're going to use old footage slash CGI to bring them back in the scenes. You see what with Paul Walker with the Fast and Furious franchise after he passed. Is there something unmoral when somebody has passed away to bring their face back to life to put them in new situations um, with music. Is it, is it cool to release their songs afterwards or is there something that like we should respect if it didn't get released because who knows if they would have okayed it. 
man, I, I don't, I don't know how to answer that, but I think as a fan, I mean, I want to, I want to hear as much Prince as possible, you know? And as a, again, as, as a really, a, as a big fan, as a, just a fan of music, I sometimes enjoy, uh, the less quality, uh, you know, products, the more raw demos or like live outtakes or, or sound checks or rehearsals that to me. So I, I, I tend to kind of learn, learn more from that than anything. Cause it's, cause that's kind of like in your purest form, you're, you know what I'm saying? So I, I don't know how to answer that whole thing, man. I mean, you know, again, it's legacy also like, you know, like if, if I, if I died anytime soon, you know, I wouldn't mind my stuff being out there for people to hear it, kind of get a glimpse of me of, of who I am. I don't know. I, I mean, I think it is cool, especially for someone like Carrie Fisher, who people loved and and admired and respected. And I mean, why not? You know, I mean, I I think it's really, of course, politics get involved, man. Politics and just you know management and all this stuff. So, um, but at the end of the day, man, it's like cool. You know, I I would love to see their work being done that way. How do you feel about it? I think there's something different between using somebody's voice and sound compared to their face. Um, I always use like, again, there's for anybody that didn't watch fast nine. I don't know if you saw fast nine in theaters. Um, I haven't yet. Not yet. Are you going to, I don't want to spoil anything for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife's been, be, be, you know, big into the franchise, so I'm sure we'll catch it. You know, she was a big Paul Walker fan. Well, there, there's some rumors of like, them casting Paul Walker's brother to potentially bring him back to round out the saga, but play Paul. I heard about that. Okay. I don't know how I feel. Like if it's Paul's brother, like without the CGI and they're just making him kind of like look like it with makeup, trying to play the same character. A lot of Hollywood has recasted characters before. So I'm not worried about the recasting and like the same name, but recasted. I kind of draw the line. If somebody has passed away, not even started on a film, but like then giving their approval, like through a family member or whatever to continue on their legacy, because who knows what they would have did if they would have said, yes, there could have been beef. You don't know what they would have wanted to do in that situation. Um, which then comes out to, if they can do it with a fast and furious franchise, who says somebody like in a different, um, say star Wars wanted to bring Paul Walker in all of a sudden, and they wanted to have like a Paul Walker, star Wars character. Like, can you just give away somebody's rights and their face off screen? Like, so they can appear on screen even though they're passed away, like at what point does it end? I guess, you know, you give somebody an inch, they take a mile type thing. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah. but face to me is different than I guess sound because you could in, in what was it? It was, um, they used Alec Guinness's, the old Obi-Wan voice in the new, um, star Wars stuff, but he had passed away. Who knows how many years ago? I forget when Alec Guinness passed away, but so they reuse voices all the time as flight like flashbacks and through the force and connecting throughout different genres and movies. So I don't know. I kind of draw the line between the looks visually and like the sound. Gotcha. Yeah. See, I mean, that's, um, that's definitely an area that obviously you're way more passionate about than I am. And you know, way more about it. I mean, you know, I, I would see it as legacy again. It's like, if, if that's gonna, you know, carry on, the, the legacy of Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Who is this massive, you know, character. If it's going to kind of carry on and continue and it kind of continue to inspire, maybe some people that will watch it be like, who's Obi-Wan Kenobi? I've only seen the new Star Wars. So maybe that might inspire them to watch all the Star Wars. I don't know, dude. You know, like um, I'm a big Terminator fan, right? So this is not a coincidence, but I happen to be wearing my, my Cyberdyne, systems t-shirt from uh, nice. terminator i love I, it are you a, are you a terminator fan i'm an old terminator fan like the t1 t2 uh any, okay. th right. anything past then no <laughs> all right so t2 changed my life t2 is phenomenal now the other ones yeah you know i don't know if we're going to talk about those but anyway so like i like the new terminator uh because of the fact that they brought back arnold and cgi and the way they tied things in i was like I loved it. I was like, that's real. Obviously, it's Arnold from, you know, we're trying to do 1984 Arnold, um, which was, I thought it was really cool. I loved how they used it for the context of it all. Um, and it was just for that little scene, just to kind of like give you a heads up of, of what things were going to look like. So I, as a, as a big Terminator fan, I really liked that. Like I said, I'm not against CGI. I'm just like, say Arnold Schwarzenegger passed away. And like three years down the road, they wanted to say, hey, we're starting to film a new Terminator. 
do we have permission to use his image and bring him back that so, way? Are you saying for like so for um uh Fast and the Furious Nine? So is that gonna be like the entire movie is gonna have his CGI face? Well, not he doesn't appear in Fast Nine. But I'm just oh, saying I'm sorry. so like Fast Ten plus whatever they decide to do. Ten, okay, yeah, like, right. If okay. they brought back Paul Walker's image using CGI and he hasn't filmed it, but the family still gives him permission to do so. Like I don't know where the gray area is there. Like I guess that's my that's my question because once somebody that would be a gray area. I I agree. Like once some, like... somebody passes away, type thing, rather than like oh they started filming or like Schwarzenegger, good example because he's been he they they're paying him to be involved with the project and he gave his okay. But say he passed away and they're like oh let's do another what was one like Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> say they did yes. another Conan with him, like but he he had been passed away for like three years, like. At what point does the family give the permission and what time does like it's like okay just recast move on yeah i i, I yeah I, I see your point i think i would lean more on the on the that's probably not the best thing to do if it's like a cameo like a quick like flashback or something like that i think that's a nice touch and, and it brings might bring really good context to the movie oh i like that stuff i think it's great yeah yeah but if it's like like a, an entire like the main character of the movie with like a CGI. Yeah, I agree with you, man. I think that I might be a little weirded out about that. Um, but uh, you know, if they're planning to, I don't know, man. I mean, if they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it. What are you gonna do? Well, the family's gonna get paid well, that's for sure. Well, I mean, yeah, you know, haters are gonna hate, bro. No matter how you <laughs> slice it. <laughs> so I know that we were talking a little bit about corporate and like we went we went into the more film aspect of it about how, like how things are designed certain ways by corporates and organizations and studios but i did want to get into because i know you're a christian artist you do a lot of christian work recently um so let's talk about hill like everybody wants to sound like hillsong everybody wants to sound like mercy me all of a sudden like and there seems to be like and i know you talked about it with david a little bit and i won't go through that conversation because people will be able to watch that conversation when all that gets put out but you know, I, I guess it's a hard way to, to ask it, but why why is everything formula, formulated for Christian artists? And why isn't there more like independent work? So, um, well, there's definitely tons of independent, you know, uh, independent artists, indie artists. There's let, way, me, let there's me rephrase way, that. Let me, let me rephrase yes. that. Why is everything following the mainstream line when it comes to that? Well, I hate to say it, but it's all about money at the end of the day, bro. You know, um, for example, these uh, Christian record labels, they're, most of them are owned, if not all of them, they're probably owned or operated or pretty much driven by uh, non-Christian, you know, CEOs and, um, and managers. So, you know... But even if they were, at the end of the day, it's like it's like you have a bakery or if you have a, a tattoo shop, it's like you're there to make money. So, you know, if, you, if you're a tattoo artist and someone wants a butterfly, <laughs> you're like, I really want to create this masterpiece of like Lord of, the, or Lord of the Rings or whatever. But someone wants a butterfly because they're paying you money. Would you say no because a butterfly and you're tired of it? So... I, I've learned how to respect both sides. I've learned how to respect the industry, and I understand what, what they're doing. Um, I, I guess what's more <clears throat> dangerous and confusing to me is that uh, for a lot of people, um, you know, let's just talk Christian music for a second. A lot of people only think that Christian music happens to be K-Love, right? K-Love is, you know, one of the one of the big uh, Christian radio stations in the country. So, and they pl they'll play like 20 artists in rotation, maybe 25, 30, whatever, you know, but it's pretty much what the record label pumps out. They're like, okay, here's the artist, here's the new song. So for, I don't know what the percentage is, let's say 90% of the people that listen to this, that is who they think Christian music is. That is what they think Christian music is. Now you and I know it's way more than that. It's actually flipped that's probably not even 10%. I would say that's like 1% of, of, of the creation from the, in the musical world that's created uh, by Christian artists. You know, a lot of it just happened, doesn't happen to sound like elevation or, 
Hillsong or, uh, you know, whatever Danny Goki, whatever artist is on the radio, King and Country, uh, actually King and Country or Killer Soros, Danny Goki. Um, I love them all, Hillsong, Elevation. Um, but I think, you know, where I kind of get, you know, more um, uh, saddened is when, um, you know, indie artists that are creating beautiful insane content beautiful music that's uh written for god about god um that kind of gets squashed because they don't have the power that the industry has you know but you know on the flip side of that we live in a youtube spotify apple music world right that you could have your content up and it could be on the same platform as we were talking about you know next to the big names but you know, to get to those, it's it's very difficult. Uh, so I'm I'm in between, man. You know, I'm in between because I respect that and I see why. Um, I may not agree with it, but I mean that's just my opinion. You know, but I do feel for the artists that are creating beautiful content that don't really have a voice. I feel like I'm gonna get shunned with this next question, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> I love it. Bring it. <laughs> So do you feel like, okay, so the mainstream Christian songs, you know, everyone that you could think of has the word God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, whatever within their song, about 40, 50,000 times within that song. Do you think that the Christian artist or the Christian industry overuses the word of God, like the name of God in different forms too much in their song and doesn't relate to normal person that's trying to listen to the story? Because the way, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I was talking to somebody just this morning. And it was more so like, he's like, well, I'm trying to, because he's going in the mission field and he's trying to raise money to go in the mission field. And because I'm, I guess he's heading out in September or October, something around there. And he's trying to get different bases. He's like, I don't know how to talk to somebody that's, that doesn't believe in God, you know, about how to campaign and raise money to go overseas. Because as we know, missionary work is not just preaching the word of God. It's not just setting up churches. It's also helping within that community, wherever you go. It's also helping build houses. It's also all this other different stuff, you know, just the human aspect of it. So do you feel like, and again, this is where I feel like I'm going to get shunned from. Do you feel like they use God, Jesus, Christ, Lord too much in their songs and don't focus on the personal feeling? Oh, no, I think, I think that's great. I know exactly what you're asking. So, Imagine you're in church, right? And then pastor's delivering a message, and then he's like, hey, if there's anyone out there who has not accepted Jesus as her Savior, you know, and he does the prayer, pray with me. And then if you pray, the Bible says if, if you pray and ask for forgiveness, you know, you will be saved, right? So people lift their hands. Here's kind of, I'll, I'll answer that. You know, uh, being, being, you know, in full-time ministry uh, and being a worship pastor for years, um, it's like you see people lifting their hands, right? But then those very same people are not necessarily walking the way that they should walking, let's say, or um, or maybe are not truly saved. And that's the thing, dude. I don't know, right? You don't know. We can't play Holy Spirit. I don't know who's truly saved. You know, was it really authentic when they lift their hands? It could have been out of emotion. It could have been because, you know, I don't know, dude. So that's where, like... Going back to, like, is there too much God or Jesus? I think that comes down to the writers. Like, were they authentic? When they were writing the song in their own private room and studio, the quest, the real question is, A, were they writing it because they truly wanted to worship Jesus? Or, B, were they writing it because the record label said, I need you to write a song just like Graves into Gardens or write a song just like Shout to the Lord or how great is our God? Because then you're diving into a whole new world. So I don't know how to answer that. And I've learned, bro, how to stay away from critiquing things that are out of out of um out of my job description, I guess you could say, you know, or above my pay grade, people say. You know, like you go on YouTube, if you tap in Joel Osteen on YouTube right now, you're gonna get Joel Osteen. But you're also going to get about 50,000 videos saying why Joel Osteen is a false prophet and why he's like Satan and why he's a heretic. And, and I'm like, that's where I draw the line, dude. I'm like, you know, listen, Judgment Day is going to come one day, bro. We're going to be in heaven. 
we're going to be <laughs> in front of Jesus. And he's going to be asking us some questions. He's like, why did you do this? You know, I'm guessing, I, I doubt he's going to be asking, hey, man, you know, uh, on your podcast, why didn't you do that or that? I think it'll be probably more like, hey, Donnie, you know, were you, you know, uh, were you truly activating the fruits of the spirit? Were you kind? Were you generous? Were you loving? You know, like all these things, were you respectful? You know, did you love your neighbor as yourself? Those are the kind of questions that I think will be asked. If we're artists, right? Hey, you know, he might ask something like, you know, what did you do with the gift I gave you, Donnie? You know, with a hey, chef, you know, chef X, Y, and Z, that knife that I gave you, what you do with it? Did you make a great meal or did you go and kill someone with it? So I think it comes down to that, bro. So to answer your question, like I've learned how to stay in my lane and, and you know, I, I'll still, I have my personal opinion about it, you know, um, but at the end of the day, it's a personal preference because I could really hate that song on Caleb. But here's the thing, bro. Someone could be listening to that song and be in that place in life that they need to hear those words in those lyrics. So that song can bring them to Jesus. Who am I, dude, to criticize a song that's going to bless 20 other people just because I may think it's a formula? I don't know if that makes sense, bro. But well, No, it does because like there's and again, I've n I never hate on people for liking certain movies. You know, like I could reference the new Star Wars stuff, in my opinion, is god awful. You know, I don't, I won't, I don't like the way they took the Last Jedi. That's my worst film of all time, hands down. But like, so I'm not, but I'm not going to hate on somebody for liking stuff that I don't. Now there can, there can be a premise of which, like, we could sit there. Like, I, I always use this reference. I don't know if you ever watched the movie Battleship. Have you ever seen Battleship? I don't think I have. So Hasbro game just made a battle. You know, the the game Battleship. So Hasbro made a movie, just like the, they were going off the G.I. Joes of the world and stuff like that. So they made a movie, and it starred Liam Neeson. And uh, there was a few other higher-end actors like Rihanna that were in it. But it was it's probably one of the worst. There's no plot to it. It's, it's, it is a terrible <laughs> film. But every time it's on, I watch it. <laughs> yes. You know, you know, it's one of those films. So I'm like, listen, I can understand how people hate it. It has no plot. And I was like, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible film in that aspect. But I love it. Now, yeah. when it comes to The Last Jedi... This is the counter move. I don't care if you hate the film. I don't care if you love the film. But if if you sit there and say, hey, it had a good plot when it did not have a plot at all. And that's why I'm kind of asking because I was like, we can agree that it was – we can agree to disagree that it was a good or bad film. But if it doesn't have the actual – like if it doesn't have a plot or doesn't have the initiative of like somewhere somewhere in the middle there, like the actual arc of storytelling, it's like then I kind of tend to correct him a little bit. I was like, eh, you know. But I can understand where you're coming from. But – that's why I'm just wondering if we use, or if, I'm not even saying if we use, but if the mainstream media just used the word God, Lord, Jesus, more in their songs to sell than it was to actually motivate people. That's all I really asked. That was just an off-the-cuff yeah. off question. Yeah. No, that that's really good, man. I mean, you know, all that music, all that uh, worship music, it's it's called vertical music because it's it's sung straight to, to God, right? So, you know, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, you're my, you know, you are all this stuff. And at school, then you have your horizontal worship, which is, you know, like, hey, here's my testimony. God, you brought me out of this. Lord, you brought me out of that. And now I'm, this is who I used to be. Now I'm a brand new man. So it's kind of, and that's kind of like, you know, I kind of, I, I go both ways, man. Like I love writing, you know, this horizontal and vertical. I, I guess I'll, I'll also answer you by saying this. I think that authenticity and you being real about what you're writing is probably way more important than the actual quality of it. Here's why. Because, you know, you go and listen to someone like Bob Dylan, right? Some people can say this guy's the worst singer of all time, which <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, he's not the best singer. But the way he was singing, the way he was writing in the, con the, in the context of it all, uh, Bob Dylan was a genius, you know? Um, you know, you have, you know, it comes down to hearts, man. You know, if the heart is right, if they truly doing it, giving it their all, even if it's, if it's four chords and that's all they know, but they're going hard at it, you're going to get my high five, bro. You know, even though I may be more, I, I, I'm more leaning on the crazy arrangements and stuff and, and ear candy and, and all that stuff. But if it's authentic, I think you can, that comes across. 
You know what I'm saying? So, so question for you, man. So, um, how do you can, let me flip that question into more of the cinematic world, right? Cause Christian movies tend to lean more on the lower quality slash, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm glad you're saying like this B, because I was about C. to ask you almost the same thing. So good, good. <laughs> really? Please okay. ask me. Yeah. I mean, how do you, you know, what's your take on, obviously we have, you know, all these Christian companies and movies, which again, I love and I appreciate, but then you have like the passion of the Christ, right? So, um, what's, what's your take on, on, on the Christian movie industry and, and, and what they're doing, what they've done and what they can improve on? Well, I'll give the, um, I'll give your slope first to the music industry. So your music industry for Christian artists is going up, 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 but it's, pro- <laughs> it's progressively going up. It's in little sacr- increments. But it's like it's rising and you could tell there's rising, especially in the arts for like musicians of Christian songs in the film industry. It's kind of just like a flat line for some reason. And it, the way I kind of describe my films whenever I do some now, not everything is going to be rainbows and butterflies when it comes to the films. Um, so what I try to do is I add the human world aspect. A lot of people watch Christian films and the Christian film industry right now makes a lot of films that, you know, say somebody's dying of cancer and they accept God into their hearts. All of a sudden cancer say, you know, it's healed. And that's the end of the story. I'm over here. Like, but does that really happen? Like that only happens like maybe one, maybe 1% of the time, possibly that somebody accepts God in their heart. And then like the cancer or whatever they're going through disappears. Um, I think the Christian film industry needs to be more real. Uh, they need to tell real, more accurate stories. And I, and for some reason they just can't seem to do that. I don't know if it's because again, corporate, maybe like the pure flicks, which I'm throwing pure flicks out there as a company, just because I don't really know too many other Christian companies that like can distribute films, but maybe it's pure flicks that like has a Christian film by an independent artist and they're pitching it to them. And pure flicks sits back there and it's like, you know what? No, because it, again, it doesn't mention God enough. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel re- good enough. Yeah. And, and I, and I feel like that's half the problem. But again, I'm throwing pure flicks out there because it's literally the only one that I know of other than uh, Sherwood. Is it Sherwood Studios down there in Georgia? Is that the um, who's the who did Kirk Cameron with the um, the Kendrick Brothers? Oh, I'm not sure. Kendrick Brothers, I think it's who did Fireproof. OK, that. that that rings a bell. Right. So isn't I mean, isn't Tyler Perry doing some stuff as well? Like he kind he's, of he's getting more into he opened the game. up his own. But maybe maybe we're overthinking this. Maybe. Because, again, there's been a few abortion films that have came out, uh, pro-life films, and I know that's more political than anything else. Or we at least made it more political. But, you know, maybe it's say, maybe the theater industry. Maybe we're, maybe we're taking a little bit too low of the spectrum. Maybe it's the theater industry that's not allowing these films to even be shown. You know, I don't know. Maybe we're just not seeing them because they're not even allowing them in theaters or, like, on streaming services even. So, I don't – does that answer the question? Like – Am, am yeah, I-, I, I think I think that um, and, and you can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like um, it's definitely harder for for Christian movies to kind of because <clears throat> you mentioned Pure Flix and there's a whole list of, of movies on there. And I know I had it at one point, um, but, you know, comparing it to like the independent independent Christian music, there's definitely not as much uh, in, in the movie cinematic world. You know, you pretty much just have this layer, pure flicks, and then you kind of just have your one or two, like, Passion of the Christ movies, and then that's it, you know? Um, I, 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 at least I haven't seen many indie films around, you know? Um, there is a film. I, did you ever watch The Heart of Man? I have not. So watch it. I think it, was, I think it came out of Bethel. Um I think their their video uh, department created this movie, and dude, I mean, I'll put it up there next to um, like Passion, bro. It was like it was done so beautifully, you know. It was kind of like you know the flaws of man, and but always kind of coming back to God and and really cool imagery. Anyway, so I thought it was a really cool kind of a you know almost like a documentary. Um, but yeah, I'm with you, man. I think that we need, we definitely need more Christian content that's real, that's authentic, 
um and you know dude like you know i'm a songwriter right so as a songwriter we always model especially christian songwriters will model the psalms right david so you open up the psalms right so you know uh of course there were songs about hey lord i seek you when i whenever i seek you i find you and all these cool but most of the psalms bro were all about david complaining complaining and really like you know, not saying the right things and just him being real. You know, according to some scholars, they're saying that there was a lot of swearing involved in the Psalms that obviously through translation after translation, you know, that kind of got filtered down. But there's so much authenticity in the Psalms that I think that we need to also model that side of things. I mean, listen, just David alone, right? What did David do? Everything in the book right commit adultery kill people the dude just (laughs) he did every pretty much committed every sin in the book here's what happens what happens is that you know the bible says that david the only man in the bible that, that the bible says that he was a man after god's own heart and i'm like but but god how do you say that when david did this and did that did that did that so but it was the fact that david always repented David always came back to God, always came back to God. Yeah, you know, he he did this, sin number one, sin number 2005, but he came back to God always. So if anything, man, we need to model that. We need to model the fact that he was real. And think about the fact that it was actually documented. Everything in the Bible was intentional. You know that. There's, there's no like, there's no like extras or like, you know, fluff in the Bible at all. I mean, it was very intentional. And I think God really wanted us to to read read that and have that imagery of like of of man being full of flaws, you know, for us to be like, man, you know, uh, we could, you know, we could be full of flaws, but as long as we repent and come back to Jesus every time. And everybody too thinks the Bible like is like, oh, God is always. God is always good and he's always supplied for us what he has, but like good, good in terms of maybe I even mispronounced myself there, but like they, they think of the Bible as like this rainbow and butterfly thing of God being all like being all forgiving too. But there's also moments in the Bible that again, you talk about realism, you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, what God would do with Sodom and Gomorrah, like God's wrath is throughout the Bible too. If you don't listen to his commands, he'll hit you back five times harder than you can punch him, you know? And a lot of people, a lot of people don't see that aspect either. But maybe that's part of the realism that gets lost in all this, con- in the conversation and translation too. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's man, and, and that's where that's the the gray area, right? It's like, how do we, how do we take all this? So that's why going back to just being authentic, man. You know, just being real and writing. Some songs might be about God. Some other songs might be about my kids, which is also worship. Or some songs might might be about my situation with politics and dude i wrote a whole record about politics you know because of like or as a christian man how do i see politics how am i receiving and expressing you know what's happening right now in the world in politics and everything that's going on and i wrote an album about it and and the other thing too like because i was thinking here when you when we both talk about how we don't see a lot of christian work especially like in the movie industry but then again, I think about myself in essence, where I my main goal is not to, not to talk about God in my films, but it's simply to you you know the phrase one plants a seed, one waters a seed, one watches it grow. So what I try to do is I want to plant the seed in somebody's mind. So by watching my films, so you're not going to see language, you're not going to see nudity, you're not going to see sex in any of my productions. I, I want to stray away from that. Now you can still have the murders that go on, the shooting, the action in life, because those are realistic things. I'm not saying that swearing and all this other stuff isn't, but I'm trying to keep it family friendly and at least oriented to a better standard. But I think we're both in agreement. Whether like I think some Christian artists get thrown under the rug because they're just making moralistic content, but we don't view it as Christian work, even. Because mm. I'm thinking about myself too. Like, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. And you know, again, it's like. You know, there's so many Christians in Hollywood right now or in the secular uh, side of, of the music industry that are, man, they're they're preaching the gospel through, not necessarily through their words, of course, with their words as well, but through their actions. 
And at the end of the day, man, he is kind of like if if whoever's watching and listening, whatever your takeaway is going to be, it's like the Bible is, is very clear about you will be known by your fruits, right? So you can wear the Christian T-shirt, right? You can wear the hat, say, Jesus, I love you, or have your bracelet or whatever. You can go to church every Sunday. But if your fruits, if your actions are not modeling that, it doesn't matter what you do. So you know what? It's like... You know, I know a lot of people, man, that are in that Hollywood world. They're they're not making necessarily Christian movies, but they're Christians, bro, and they're you know, their their fruits are showing it. They're being kind, they're being loving, they're being generous. And that's where like people are like, Hey, there's something different about you. You know, that's where people people will notice that. They will notice if you're if you're faking it or if you're like, you know what? Are you a Christian or or things like that, you know? So I, I was thinking about this question for you, dude. Have you watched The Chosen? That is the what? What platform is it on? I I've watched I, an episode. I think or two, it's but. on. I think it's on YouTube, but it's mainly an app. So it's like a self-funded company, and they're they're pretty much, um, you know, uh, filming the Gospels in a really cool way, dude. Uh, this guy Dallas Jenkins, um, he's been. Uh, you know, uh, producing it's 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 really cool because it's it's pretty much the life of Jesus, but in all the you know kind of narrating all the areas that the Bible doesn't talk about, all the behind the scenes, almost like if there was if there was B roll that that we had now from the from the Bible, right? Or like you know things that were not in the Bible, what would they look like? And it's really cool. Obviously, it's an artistic expression you know, artistic, uh, you know, take on, on the Bible, but it's cool because, you know, you only have a paragraph about this or that, or, or when you just turn into wine, but what happened before that, what happened in between that and what happened after that? So that's what the show kind of like brings. And it's super cool, dude. Okay. You would do it. I think you would love it. I've heard of it. And I think I've even seen a few scenes from it, but I really don't think I've watched it all. So I got to, I mean, I definitely haven't watched it all. I'm going to throw that out there. But, like, there's – I definitely have seen some scenes from it. But since you recommended it, I will check it out. Dude, I, I think, honestly, you are probably going to geek out watching it. You're going to nerd out, and you're going to be like, this is the awesomest thing. And it's done really well, bro. You, you know, know what? But also, it's grassroots. You know what? I also have a hard time as an art – as a uh, filmmaker. I have a hard time because everybody's like – and I get, I get picked on for a lot for this, which I've never seen the Godfather movies. Okay, classics. Think of the classics. If you think of, I've never even seen Schindler's List. Okay, which a lot of people are like, how have you not seen these films? Do you feel as a musician and as an artist, do you feel like you kind of, what do I want to say? Do you feel like you have a hard time getting into certain genres or getting into certain like? Do you have to be like, what do I want to say? There's certain songs and certain movies that resonate with me at different points in time. Like it makes me. There could be a film that I love, but I have to wait like till I'm in the mood to watch it, type of thing. And like I don't get that for every film, and I just can't force myself to sit down, watch a movie, and like just experience it. I need to be like into it. Like if I see a trailer and the trailer turns me off, I'm like, I'm probably not going to watch it. You know, I don't know if this. I I might be speaking in a circle, but do you feel the same way about any of the arts or no? Um. I, I I do in um I how do I respond to it? I think that I uh I try to listen to it with uh, you know so because I play guitar that's that's my guitar player in me right because I arrange then that's the the musical arranger in me I produce that's the producer in me you know I'm not a singer necessarily by the way I'm not a singer uh, I sing background vocals. <laughs> My I mean, hey, when I, when, I heard, when I heard you speak into the microphone or do that thing like the wow thing at the concert, oh, the, 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 the talk good. box, I can fake that. I can fake singing through the talk box very well, but that's it. So, um, how was my impersonation? So when I hear right a there, song, by the way? how was that? Was that actually a good impersonation? Of wow, that that was good, man. That, okay. I mean, you know, I you're, work on you're it. a little pit, you're a little pitchy. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just give me the Simon Cow. You're you're awful. You're terrible. Yeah, no, I, I, I would. I think I'm more of a Randy. Like yo, dog. That that's gonna be a no for me, dog. Oh, you're you're not an old Paula. You <laughs> no. I'll, okay. I'll stay with Randy. I think I'm more of a Randy guy. <laughs> well, you did like Michael so, Jackson. So you know what, Randy's his brother. There you go. Perfect. 
Red. Good fit. <laughs> well, that, well, that's a different Randy Jackson. Oh, is it actually? I did not know that. I yeah, that's a different Randy Jackson. He wasn't Jackson, part of the Jackson yeah. 5? Yeah, no, that's, um, you know, you're thinking of uh, the actual Randy Jackson from Jackson 5. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the American Idol Randy Well, so Jackson. was I, but I thought they were the same person. That's not true then. No, different guy, yeah. But he did, he played, dude, he phenomenal, talk about musicians, bro. He's top notch, dude. He played bass for Journey in the 80s. He was like Journey's bass player for a long time. And like, I think Phil Collins and a bunch of other people. But So, um, to your question, um, I, I listen, that's how I listen to music. So, you know, my wife's really like tapped into the, the, the pop, like what just came out on the radio. And that helps me a lot because I'm like, oh, I'm listening to Imagine Dragons or or this new artist. And I'm like, it may be pop, but I, I can really appreciate kind of where it came from. I think this is how I, I listen. I listen in a way that I'm a student. So especially with having YouTube nowadays, you can type in the song and have a whole story behind or the artist talk about the song. So and this is kind of where I geek out. This is my where I dive into bunny trails and I can be on YouTube for hours is that, you know, I'll, I'll listen to how the song was written. It's like, well, this song was written, blah, blah, blah. And it was inspired by Queen, the song, whatever, Bohemian Rhapsody, just to give you an example. So here I am like, oh, let me go listen to Bohemian Rhapsody and try to pick like what they grab from that. So like, I've always been that guy that will always kind of go back and back and back and it has really allowed me to um, discover, bro, and learn so much stuff. Especially for you know being a big uh, you know big fan of blues, go back to the 1930s with Robert Johnson or like Charlie Patton, or or in the 50s with like Muddy Waters in the 60s, and you know even the Beatles, right? Listen to the Beatles, and they had their influence of stuff. You know, there's a great documentary on Hulu. Uh, with Paul McCartney and uh, you know Rick Rubin, I don't know if you've seen it, you know, but it talks about how the Beatles were really influenced by uh, the Beach Boys, right? Pet Sounds, which influenced uh, uh, Sgt. Pepper's album, right? You listen to it, and there's not a lot of like similarities, but the production was what made it very similar in all the layers and layers of music and that that the Beatles were not doing before. Anyways, I say all that to say that, um, you know, I love kind of going, learning about why the song is like this, you know? Oh, it's like this because it grabbed, you know, a little bit from there and a little bit from that. And I, I appreciate that. So that's kind of how I listen to music, whether it's brand new pop that just came out on the radio or it's country or you know, stuff from whatever, the 70s, and, you know, there's an influence to everything. And then there's Don McLean's American Pie, and nobody really knows what the heck's going on in that sound. <laughs> you know, after verse number 75, you know. <laughs> after about but, the 10th uh, you know, minute that goes by, it's just like, okay, uh, when are we going to wrap this up? Remember um, Billy Joel used to sing a song, I think it was called The Entertainer. If you got to make a hit, then you got, or if you're going to make a hit, you got to make a bit. So you cut down to 305 or whatever. Is there like a, is there like a time? Oh gosh. Is there a time yes. strain on you guys as artists? Like how, when do you know that your song's too long? Uh, well, I mean, so the, the, you know, the, the protocol or the guideline is between three and a half minutes and like four, 15, four and a half minutes is like pushing it. But Depends on what, you know, but usually between like, you know, three and a half minutes to like four minutes, four fifteen is usually pop radio, but it all comes down to our attention spans, right? And like, you know, formulas, right? So record labels try to replicate and duplicate, imitate formulas. So, hey, if it worked for, I can only imagine, mercy me, and it sold millions and millions. Let's try to duplicate that again with the same chord progression, the same length. And it almost sounds like it, but it doesn't, you know? So, um, yeah, it's almost like a movie in your end. Like if it's a movie, like what, 90 minutes is usually like the standard, it seems like to me. But then you have your two-hour Netflix movies, you know. What's that latest one with uh, – it had Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, all the big oh, ones. Oh, that was um – Oh, I'm blanking now. 
Talk about it, CGI. Yeah, dude. well, it was a that was a mafia movie, correct? I'm trying to remember what it was. Yes, um, but wasn't that like four hours, like three hours or four hours or something like that? I know they make it made a joke at the Oscars that they cut half the movie out, even so, it was like eight hours. Now, but, <laughs> um, I, I I'm blanking on the name, which is sad because I did watch it. Yeah, I I mean we're you know obviously you know what I'm talking about, but but yeah, man, I mean it's kind of one of those things, you know, but. You know, I, I get it. We have attention spans. What what's our attention span now? Like five seconds. You know, we're we're like an hour into our podcast here, and we probably tuned out ninety percent of the people. <laughs> well, that's good though, because then they didn't uh, they didn't hear my slip up on Randy Jackson because I am still blown away. I thought that my whole life I thought it was the same Randy Jackson. Oh really? No, the different Randy Jackson. Yeah, yeah. And then you have Alan Jackson, who's a completely different. I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> different Jackson. Different Jackson. Different Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> For independent artists out there, what is your advice to anybody that's growing up or that's trying to make their way into the music field? Do you have any parting advice for independent artists? Absolutely, man. I have probably have a, a whole list, top 10 of them. Um, number one, man, I would say always have a model. Um, always be a student. Don't think, don't think just because you're getting pretty good at your craft or your art, you know, you, you got it all down because, you know, God will always find a way to humble you down. Um, or go on YouTube and type in whatever you're into. And then there's going to be thousands of people doing it way better than you. So I think having a model, having, uh, accountability in what you're doing, I think it's really important have someone that can guide you and be like, Hey, um, you know, you should try to do more of this and you know have that one person that you can trust whether it's uh, a personal uh, personable thing that's someone that you can literally have coffee with or it might be someone that you that you admire that's that's a celebrity i know for me i had several of those they were mainly celebrities that i looked up to and uh thank god for youtube i would watch the interviews and and i would be like you know what i love how they responded to that i want to be like that and I try to model myself after that. Um, you know, create content. I think f- try to find who you are and embrace who you are because you are going to be different no matter how you slice it. I think be authentic to that and allow God to to use that and, and see it as an advantage, uh, not a, as a uh, disadvantage. Um, stop comparing yourself. It's so easy to compare ourselves to that you know the next person because if we do that we're never going to end and we're going to end up quitting and being discouraged so it's like you know grab that and and you know model it you know let that inspire you release content and at the end of the day man try to be as authentic and we've been talking i think the takeaway of this whole conversation has been you know be real be authentic be genuine with who you are because you are different from everyone else and then what do you have to offer that's different? Trying to find that. It might take you a minute, and that's okay. I mean, I think it's, you know, for me, it's, um, I feel like I kind of have a groove. I don't, I don't think I'm quite there yet. I, I hope I'm not. I'm, I'm 39. I hope I, you know, when I'm 80, I'm still fine. I'm still looking for it, you know. Um, but keep, keep growing and evolving. You know, keep learning. Always be a student. Learn from people, you know. Even Donnie, even our conversation now, it's like, man, this is good. I got your perspective on all these things. It made me understand you more. Um, and I think, you know, collaborate. Collaborate with people. Don't be a one, you know, a one one dude. It's not a, a one man sport. While we do in the creative world, you have to be able to collaborate um and respect. You know, just because it's different from you, it's because it's, it's uh, you may not like it necessarily, but it's it doesn't mean that it's bad. You know, it's just different, and I've I think I've learned how to appreciate that without immediately critiquing it. Because our first instinct is to what, Donnie? Critique it. Be like, no. And I'm like, you know what? People love it. There's millions of other people that may love that. So obviously, you don't have all the answers. So I, staying humble, dude. I think uh, kind of all of the above, everything I just kind of talked about. And, you know, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe in God and, you know, man, keep seeking God in everything you're doing, especially in your in your craft. Um, know that God has given you that platform. I think, you know, we all have a platform, whether it's working at McDonald's, frying fries, 
or a CEO of a, of a company or you know, a filmmaker like yourself or a musician like myself. We all have a platform. So some, some are bigger th- or bigger than others, but I think we have to learn how to use our platform the right way. You know, the Bible says, "Hey, you know, you will be you know, you will be known um, as children of God of, of how much peace you bring, right? Um, that's my paraphrase, you know. Uh, peacemakers will be will be known, right? So um, are you a peacemaker? Are you dividing? Especially in the world that we live in right now, it's easy to divide, right? So are you bringing peace or are you bringing division in what you're doing? That to me is, is really important, man. John Sandoval, everybody. John, where can people find you at? <laughs> uh, they can go to johnsandoval.com or sandovalband.com. Uh, my name, by the way, it's spelled J-E-A-N. It's a French name. I'm not French. I don't know why my parents decided to give me a French name, but it's uh, Jean, J-E-A-N, sandoval.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, Instagram. I'm on uh, you know all the, all the big socials. I'm on MySpace. If you're in MySpace, I'm just kidding. I don't know. What happened to Tom? I miss Tom. If you're in MySpace, what happened to Tom? I don't know, but... I don't, I don't know if you could see me. For some reason, my FaceTime ended, but I can still hear you, so I don't know what's up with that. Okay, yeah, it says that it's paused, but I, I don't see you. Okay. Well, thank you, John, for joining me. Well, thanks for having me on, bro. appreciate it. Really good conversation, man. <laughs>